When I was a boy, I believed that the sea was boundless and indestructible to human pressures. Now I know better. Most of the biggest fish have been harvested, and there are places where jellyfish have become the catch of the day. Most of the world's coral reefs are bleached or dying. There are dead zones the size of small states off our coasts. And all at a time when we have to deal with aquaculture, wind and wave energy, even oil and gas exploration that are staking claims in our waters. But I have also learned there is a smarter, more lasting course than the one we're on. In 2010, the United States adopted its first ever national ocean policy, a policy that now calls for bringing together people from across the societal spectrum to carry out a new, far-sighted strategy for sustaining the country's ocean, coasts, and Great Lakes. It is founded on a branch of conservation, more formally known as ecosystem-based management, more simply, as a common sense approach to preserving life. It is backed by science and based on the needs of the human community in balance with that of its ecological provider, the sea. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Shipping is extremely important to this economy. One in eight jobs in Southern California is associated with the port activity, and then nationwide it's between three and four million jobs. So I see marine spatial planning as a tool that will help ports uh, delineate the area where traditional maritime uses are gonna be protected. Scientific research. Do we need and it? We're finally getting it, thanks to our reserve. If it's not too late. No, it's not too late. Our I fishers, said if. Yes, it's not. To meet some of the movement's pioneers, we will journey from coast to coast, as well as the land between. From the fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, to farmers along the Mississippi River, to the Gulf of Mexico from divers in the Florida Keys to whale researchers and industrial shippers in Massachusetts Bay. All are now practicing a new philosophy of marine stewardship, of prosperity through preservation. We're now inside the Stillwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. This is, um, 850 some square mile marine protected area off the coast of Massachusetts and it's an extremely productive area, one of the most productive areas in the Gulf of Maine. She might come up right here again. You can just drift forward a little. She might come up again. Stellwagen Bank is a place of unusual richness, a mixing bowl of upwelling currents and nutrients that feed multitudes of fish and seabirds marine mammals, and people. When in 1992, Stellwagen Bank became a national marine sanctuary, it inherited a long and busy history 
of boat traffic. The sanctuary's waters are plied by all forms of vessels, and that has posed a growing challenge for the largest and oldest residents of Stellwagen. Well, the problem that we're trying to deal with in, in this particular piece is really North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales and finback whales, all these endangered species, being struck and killed by large commercial vessels. By that I mean uh, ships that are 300 gross tons or more. There's more and more cargo ships going in different directions from overseas and up and down the coastline. There's a lot of recreational uses, there's commercial uses. A lot of demand for wind power to be done out on the ocean. We now have two offshore uh, liquefied natural gas terminals off the coast of Boston. Knowing that some of the rarest whales in the world were dying in the shipping lanes of Boston Harbor, the Massachusetts Port Authority, Dave Wiley, and the shipping industry together set out to save them. The most immediate questions were simple to ask, yet hard to answer. Where do the whales feed? Where do they congregate? Where are the commercial ships traveling, and how fast? The answers eventually came by way of millions of little bits of data. All vessels, 300 gross ton or larger, are required to carry an AIS system or automatic identification system that was developed between us and the Coast Guard. And the way that we've done this is we've set up three antennas across the sanctuary. And the idea is that we can triangulate and get full coverage throughout the entire sanctuary. So what happens is a ship comes through the shipping lane or any other parts of the sanctuary. It transmits a signal every two to ten seconds, giving its ship information plus also its latitude, longitude, and speed, and where it's heading, and what type of vessel it is. Stellwagen's lab collected more than 150 million records each year, pinpointing all the large ships within the sanctuary. Coming up, coming towards us. Determining the whale's whereabouts required different skills. Okay. The other one is still on the left, even though the flipper's over the back of him. We're saying, you don't want to tag the belly up one. You want to keep coming off balance, just like this. Just like this. Okay, right, okay. Good placement, wait till she brings her back up. You're right on the right spot. Let her, wait, let her bring it up, let her bring the back up. Let her bring the back up now. Oh. Perfect, yeah. perfect. To track the whales, Wiley and his crew employed a new device called a D-tag, a miniature computer harmlessly fastened to the whales with suction cups. Come to the left, 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 come down. Perfect! Oh, oh man, beautiful. Wow. Very beautiful. All right. When the tag detaches from the whale, a radio beacon leads scientists to its location to retrieve it. The D-tag has granted us a far more intimate picture of the whale's underwater world. This animation is based on the information gathered from the D-tag. Here we see the feeding behavior of humpback whales as it has rarely been seen before. But the D-tag allows us to get down to the bottom and see that, in fact, they are doing this sort of rolling behavior and feeding on what you're seeing here, which is the sand lance right along the bottom, um, sometimes during the day, mainly at night. And superimposed in here is some fixed fishing gear, which you'll see here is a gill net, and then also the surface lines going up to the uh, surface. So as you can see, this animal did a really good job avoiding um, the potential entanglement. Other whales are not so lucky. North Atlantic right whales are found typically feeding near the surface, at a depth of 15 to 20 meters or less. 15 meters is also the keel depth of large vessels entering the port of Boston. 
putting whales into strike range. With as few as 350 members of its kind remaining, the death of even a single breeding female can tip the species towards extinction. So one of the next things we wanted to look at is how serious of a problem is this? So another visualization here is showing you, uh, again, the sanctuary is dropped into 3D here, and these are nautical mile uh, grid cells. And the height of the, um, each of the cells that you're seeing is, in fact, the dense areas where there's the most population of whales. Thompson and Wiley overlaid the shipping lanes and saw a collision waiting to happen. There were also areas in the sanctuary that were less used by whales. So we decided it'd be a good idea, very smart, uh, to try to move the shipping lanes from areas that whales used a lot to areas that the whales used with much less frequencies. Wiley took his idea of moving the shipping lanes to the port operators group, presenting his data and offering solutions that were good for the whales. But were they good for the shippers? Our initial response to the, uh, the proposed shift in the, in the traffic lanes uh, was guarded, and then uh, we had some concerns uh, for navigational safety. It was the first time that, you know, we'd ever been approached that, at that level uh, in that detail to figure out what was going on in the ocean. You, know, you can't manage it if you don't know who's out there and what they're doing. So With a clearer picture of all the pieces, both the shipping industry and the whale champions realized their needs were not so incompatible after all. They would have some more questions, we'd rework the data, and after about six months we came to an agreement of what we thought would be a particular um, configuration for the shipping lanes that would give us very good conservation benefit for right whales and the other endangered whales, and also would have minimal impact upon the shipping industry. The lane was shifted north, to come in a direction like this. This would represent what the new shipping lane looks like as opposed to the old one. I mean, there have not been any incidents, so. The last thing that we want to do is to, to harm one of the animals with a ship. And, and, and nobody wants to do that. The shippers don't want to do that. The pilots don't want to do that when they're on the ship. So we, we want to take the steps and we educate the, the captains and everybody involved so that that risk is, is reduced. Yeah. There's been close to 100% compliance with the ships following the, the uh, voluntary lanes, and I think that's testimony to how much the industry really embraced it. Boston became the first port in the nation to change its shipping routes to protect marine mammals, reducing the whale's risk of being struck by more than 80%. but there would be little time for celebration. Because at the same time we were moving the shipping lanes, the liquid natural gas companies through the Deepwater Port Act were working to put two deep water ports uh, just a few miles from the sanctuary border and in the area that we were moving the shipping lanes to. Now you can't have shipping lanes and deep water ports coexisting. So now we had in conflict a project that was very important for endangered whale conservation and of course the LNG very important to the nation for energy independence and security. Well Accelerate Energy I looked at the market in the northeast US as far as there was a great energy need here and we have a solution to bring an incremental supply of natural gas to the northeast and that's where we developed the northeast gateway deep water port we knew coming in that the whales would be an issue so i got this phone call from these guys at accelerate going hey you know what time is money every day we're not in the water that's that's costing me a million dollars and people sitting around waiting to start building this terminal fix it Again, the questions to Stellwagen's dilemma would eventually be answered by the whales and an alliance of people willing to listen.
for in fact the whales were speaking amongst themselves, as were most of the creatures of the sea. A phenomenon of vital underwater chatter that humanity had only lately begun to decipher. Well, there are no deaf marine vertebrates. Fish, they're all hearing. Whales, they're all hearing. Now we're discovering that all the invertebrates, the lobsters and the crabs and the shrimp, they're all doing it too. In the ocean, everybody's listening to sound and most everybody's making sounds. Right whales make this particular call called the right whale up call. It kind of goes, and that's a call that they use for contacting each other. To make sure that no whale would go unheard, Accelerate Energy financed a network of acoustic buoys in the middle of Boston's shipping lanes. With Cornell's bioacoustic know how, Woods Hole engineers, and Stellwagen's marine biologists all on board. The unlikely collaboration developed the nation's first ever acoustic whale detection system. As soon as the vessel enters the shipping lane, we reduce our speed to 12 knots or less. We put personnel on the bridge of the vessel and they start generally scanning for marine mammals. We made it work. We can now listen to the ocean. We have a network of these buoys right in the middle of the shipping lanes. And these are positioned about 10 miles apart so they overlap and they can listen for whales throughout this area. So this has given Cornell an opportunity to do things that they've not been able to do by having an array and having uh, year-round funding and it won't surprise me if Dr. Clark doesn't find a way to develop a network that will reach further than Boston Harbor. I'm hoping that you know we'll uh, have some part in that in the future. All the people in that group uh, came away being a little bit different as a result of the process. Um, you know, certainly the, the conservationists and scientists could understand the industry point of view a little bit better. Certainly industry could understand the science better and, and the conservation need. So if we work together on something in the future, which I'm sure we will and we actually are, um, I think it'll go about a bit easier. We have more confidence in each other to, to act in a, a straightforward and honest manner, I think, at this point.